So first of all, um, thank you, uh, Abita, for inviting me to this really interesting workshop. And I want to thank everybody for their papers. Uh, oh, no, I, sorry, sorry, I forgot about something. I have to sign again. Uh, I have to do it once more, I'm sorry. Um, I have to stop share now and do it again. I forgot that I'm linked to the monitor. What's happening? Oh. Now I have to get rid of this bar. So our first paper is um, uh, Robin Yates' paper, Disability in the North of Early and Middle Period China. And um, I, I think the use of um, legal and administrative text in this case is really helpful. It makes clear various things, in, including um, the, a basic issue of how the state is eager to register for able-bodied and um, disabled persons. But this legal and administrative perspective also help us think about what is the definition of a person. In other words, the definition of a person is in terms of his obligations towards the state in some form of service and his expectation of assistance, usually his, sometimes her expectation of assistance uh, from the state. And the question of classification is, is really interesting here, I think, because the disabled person, as, as uh, Robin pointed out, may be grouped with, with the dim-sighted elderly people or those shorter than 1.43 meters or 4.69 feet. Uh, in other words, a fully functional person, what is called a stalwart youth in Robin's translation, is one who can fully render his duty to the state. And this definition of disability does not hinge on what the disabled person can or cannot do for himself or in society, but really solely on whether he can fulfill the demands of the state. The same is true also for whether the, um, the parents have a right to kill a disabled child. Um, it, it seems that the, the question is really the, um, is, is no longer the definition of the disabled child, but rather the, the interest of the parents versus the child. So the, the parents may have the right to kill a, a handicapped child or a child who's ill-fated, who's going to bring them bad luck, then those two are classified together. So in other words, I think that the classification is really interesting for, uh, for us to not pin, not so much pin down what is disability, but to see in what, with what other things it is classified with, and then, what, what, are the, what are the implications of such classification? So, um, okay, no. I'm sorry, I didn't prepare uh, translations because I thought it's a very small workshop and everybody would be able to read Chinese, but I, I, I won't go over the text in detail. But this is an example that comes up both in um, uh, Robin Yates' paper as well as Mark Pittman's paper. And uh, it's about how, uh, Lord Pingyuan in the Warring States period, Pingyuan Jun, um, um, how how um, how his concubine, beautiful, how how did his beautiful concubine laughs at the lame person, and um, and um, and that lame person then ask Pingyuan Jun to kill that woman because. Um, um, and, and well, of course, the Pian Jun does not, does not do that. And, and as a result, his advisors begin to leave him. And, and the, the, the crux of the story is really about how uh, the lame person or the potential extra advisor is pitted against the beautiful woman. Uh, because in order to prove that he is not one who loves beauty and um, uh, hold in low regard a person who can give him advice, he has to actually kill the woman who laughs at the lame person. The reason why I bring up this example not to, is not only because it is in um, two of the papers, but I think it speaks to one of the issues that was mentioned this morning. Um, uh, namely, the whole question of whether we treat examples as historical examples or whether we treat it as a rhetorical example. Whether, um, um, so in, in this particular story, for example, the, in, in this story of the lame person versus the beautiful woman, is, is the, 
what is at stake is not really about how a lame person would be treated or what is the definition of his disability, but rather the infirmity is categorized with other qualities or conditions that may disguise the worth of someone who can render service to the Lord. So in other words, instead of being lame, this person could be just ugly or um, in a very humble sit or unlikely situation or involved in a very demeaning task and all, all that, so disability, in other words, is just a way to indicate how this person's um, worth is being hidden. So he doesn't have to be disabled at all, in other words. Um, now, of course, that does not apply to the legal administrative text that uh, Robin Yates talked about, but I think in, in many of the other texts, this question of narrative function of disability has to be kept in mind. Um, so to... to to um, amplify this point, I'll, I'll give you another example. This is from um, the, all the three commentary traditions of the Trinshu as well as from Shizhi. And this is about an episode leading up to the Battle of An. Uh, in that story, the, the tensions between uh, Qi and Jin um, arise because um, when the diplomatic um, group from Qi visits Jin, uh, from Jin visits Qi, the mother of the Qi ruler uh, laughs at the Jin envoy, Xi Ke. And this is how it appears in Zhuan that, it, that some, something about the appearance of this envoy provokes the women's laughter. And this is what ultimately instigates hostility between the two states. Uh, in the Gongyang tradition, um, what provokes laughter becomes the um, what provokes laughter is the is the state of the various um, um, retainers. So they are either lame or they are blind uh, in one eye. And in the Gulang tradition, this is embroidered even further. So it's not just the retainers anymore. It's the envoys themselves who had physical limitations. So one of them was bold, one was blind in one eye, one was lame, one was hunchbacked, and so on. And Qi, <clears throat> in order to um, show their disdain for this group, sent out um, uh, people to meet the envoys who are similarly um, handicapped. And this leads to conflicts. In Shizhi, Shizhi basically takes the, um, uh, makes up the, the, the various accounts and, uh, but is in fact closer to the Gulang account because in this account, um, the, the reason for the hostility, according to this, is because um, uh, the Jin envoy Sikhe is hunchbacked and the Lu envoy is lame and the Wei envoy is blind in one eye. And so Qi sent out similarly disabled persons to meet the guests. And that provokes the fury of Sikhe, the Jin envoy. So I think this is uh, what, what this makes clear is that although th this, this example is actually not in the papers, but I, I think it will be um, it's useful to remind us that what, what is at stake here, you, you cannot, in other words, abstract from this story that blind, uh, deaf, um, a blind uh, hunchback or lame persons um, serve on diplomatic missions. That would not be the, the message of the story. It would be <clears throat> how um, these attributes are added to these characters in order to explain the disdainful laughter of a woman, the, the, the mother of the ruler who then, uh, whose um, conducts then lead to um, conflicts between these days. Anyway, um, <coughs> that is a, I, I think that is a general question that we want to think about further. And then the second paper is Mark Pitner's paper on defining disability, a review of the language and terminology. So since this is about review of um, language and terminology, I think it may be useful to actually go to the various um, uh, lexicographical works in, in the Han and um, uh, it's, it's just a suggestion that this, this is a, a good place to go. Um, and may, maybe it's done in the, in the longer version of the paper that I read. Um, because I feel that the, the, these lexicographical texts are really not about definitions. In other words, you don't necessarily have to go there to look for the definition of what is a deaf person or blind person or different states of blindness and deafness. So what it offers us is um, basically semantic fields 
of how words are transformed by context of what sort of categorical and associative reasoning um, are involved in understanding uh, of in our understanding of various um, um, disabilities. So, for example, why why is this a, is should disability be classified as a kind of illness? Because illness is a reversible condition sometimes, but disability is not, right? So the fact that it is classified together is is interesting because this actually goes back to what um, uh, Robin's paper uh, discusses, namely if the focus is on the relationship between the state and the individual, that classification makes sense. Because if at a given moment, a sick person or lame person cannot fulfill his service towards the state, they, they, that means the same thing as far as the state is concerned, that the sick person may recover and the lame person stays lame, does not matter. Um, it, likewise, with, when we think about the responsibility of the state, in caring for um, um, disabled persons, uh, they can be grouped with people who are singwa um, right? Um, uh, widowed, um, uh, without children, um, uh, in various states of helplessness. Because that's, as far as the state is concerned, that is what matters. Not so much a dis uh, not much a definition of, not so much a definition of disability, but um, the state of this person in needing the care. Um, of the state. So, and, and this is also an example, not in uh, the three papers, but I, I think this may be a good reminder to us also of um, not just only using word search, because here, for example, there's no word about that this person being lame, right? But, but the, the story is about a person who uh, is lame. And, and then the discussion is whether he has the right to succeed to the throne. So this is um, the original heir apparent in the state of Wei, and eventually um, he's not uh, allowed to become ruler. And the arguments about him not being able to walk in, in talking about how he's not, why his um, disability disqualify him. One of the advisors even used this term that he is not fully human or, this Meng Feiren, yeah, that he is not, um, his, dis his disability rendered him totally unsuitable to become ruler. Uh, so this may be tangential, but just a reminder to all of us that we can't only do word search, which I'm often tempted to do myself because it's so convenient. Um, and then this is another example in the paper, but uh, actually Mark did not talk about it just now. Uh, but he discusses it in some detail in his paper. And this is this word long, which um, P long the long, long, which also appears in um, Robin Yates' paper. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting word because um, in the Xi Ji story, uh, it is used to describe a lame person, but this Pang Dynasty um, commentator Sima Zhen thinks that it refers to hunchback. And, He's probably doing it because of the, um, the fact that uh, the word for um, a hump and the word for long is, is homophonous. So he's just making this up, I think. But other, other examples when this word appear um, is, is quite interesting because in, um, in a story from Han Feizi, Jin Ping Gong is said to suffer from this long bing, from the sickness of this long. Uh, when he's listening to music that he should not be listening to. So it's a temporary condition, in other words, not a um, permanent impairment. And in the story from Han Shu, uh, this Chen Tang, this character who, um, who is um, asked to perform a certain service for the state, said that he cannot do it because he is Pi Long. And in this case, his sickness is uh, uh, describing, his sickness describes how he cannot flex his arm, that his arm is permanently bent or something, um, at, at, at least in, as a consequence of illness. So um, I, this probably, I shouldn't waste too much time on this, but I, I think because this character goes, um, gets, gets some detailed discussion in the paper, that's why I brought it up. So um, Mark Pinner's paper also talks about how the state cares for those who are um, um, disabled. And the example he chooses is from Xunzi. Um, there are other examples from Li Ji and uh, Huai Nanzi as well. 
And in all these cases, it's about how even if a person is disabled, there must be some qualities uh, about him that allows him to be used, that allows him to perform a service for the state. As, um, and, and Kong Ying Da's um, commentary is quite interesting in this, case, in this case, because he said that, well, if his illness is still not so serious, one cannot waste the resources of the government in um, just uh, offering things to this person. So in other words, when, when uh, we, we talk about the state's um, role in caring for disabled persons, uh, the other side of it is just as interesting. And this is something that actually is discussed in both uh, Mark Fitness paper and Jesse Chapman's paper, I think. In other words, the, the, uh, the idea that even the disabled person can serve the state in some way. So um, this is, uh, the example from um, uh, Xunzi talks about the five illnesses. So this is this example is not discussed in the papers, but I, I think it is quite interesting. It's the eight kinds of illnesses dis discussed in um, eight kinds of disabilities discussed in Guoyu. Um, the reason why I thought it is interesting is because it talks about uh, disability also as special power very much in the way that uh, um, in the paper we heard this morning, talks about um, um, this this sort of compensation um, when you have visual when you have um, sen sensory impairments in with one sense, then you you may get enhanced sense uh, with another sense, uh, enhanced power with another sense. So, for example, if the blind person can can um, be better at discerning sounds, right and and the deaf person can see better, so he can be he can be made to um, look for fires, uh, to 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 um, to tend a fire. Um, so that's that's interesting. And you in in the rest of the list, there actually um, four categories that seems to be totally useless. Uh, those of dim wit, those who can't speak, um, uh, dwarfs and those for whom no no use can be found. And what what can what can what use can there be for them? They can be um, made to live in the, in the four corners. In in the they can be made to live in the, the at the distant margins of the realm to just be there. So the idea of exiling these people um, to to populate those areas in the margins, I find that quite interesting as well. And that 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 should be considered as one kind of use. So um, to continue that train of thought on sensory deprivation and recompense, is these are probably passages known to to many of you, uh, because we already had mention of many mentions of blind musicians. So um, this poem in Shi Jing uh, Yogu describes blind musicians, and Zheng Shen's uh, uh, commentary um, describes what we saw in the earlier passage that if you cannot see, you can actually hear better. And of course, the, the, the perhaps the best example of that is Shi Kuang, who's, who has, um, who is this blind musician in, um, who appears in Zhuo Zhuan and many other texts. And um, as someone who is able to offer remonstrance, who has a heightened power of perception because of his blindness. Okay, so the last, um, paper is um, Jesse's paper, Causes and Consequences of Perceptual Impairment. And um, here we, uh, we come to this idea of the, the ruler's body and its relationship to the body politic. And the idea that excessive stimuli and overuse of the senses lead to illness. And so it's good that we end with Shi Kuang in the, in the previous slide, because the, a very good example of this is the illness of Lord Ping of Jin in the first year of Zhao Gong in Zhou Zhuan, where he is um, said to be indulging in his senses so much that he becomes ill. Um, and in the story from Han Feizi, is, in another story from Han Feizi, he also gets ill from listening to music, but in that case, not so much because of sensual indulgence, but because he is listening to music that, uh, he is, that for which he is not worthy. And that too leads to all kinds of um, imbalance. So, um, in in um, this paper, we, we hear a lot about how moral failure uh, is about the impairment of the ruler's senses and how that in turn can lead to impairment of the senses among among the people. But um, 
what what we so this is this is a I, I find this to be a really interesting contrast to one aspect of this issue that we already heard about in the lecture this morning, um, namely the idea that um, it what if overexposure um, of the senses uh, can lead to confusion, then the opposite of that is controlled input or, or diminished input, right? This, in other words, a kind of um, juxtaposition of um, the inner and outer senses or so inward and outward understanding. So in this uh, passage, it, we, we hear about um, Shi Kuang who, um, who cannot see and, and but who, who can offer all these good ideas about government and uh, Gao Yao is mute, but he, he can uh, preside over um, the execution of the law. So what, what they represent is the, the command that does not depend on speech and the vision that does not depend on looking. So, um, so what I find interesting is how in all the examples of uh, that we're given of the, the, the ruler's senses and um, cosmic equilibrium and how um, sensory blockages can serve as metaphors for general failures of understanding. What, what is interesting in such cases is that we actually don't have this kind of metaphor anymore that the seeing and uh, judging are, um, are taken straight in, in, um, in a lot of the examples here. So um, this idea that you turn your senses inward, you, you find that in, in many places, of course, with some many versions of this in Zhuangzi, also in Chen Qiu Fan Lu, and also in Xi Ji, when we talk about Fan Ting and Ni Shi, the, the hearing that goes in the reverse directions and the seeing that goes in the inward direction. And that's the highest kind of vision and the highest kind of, um, hearing. Um, which also, and, and that also reminds me of this, um, uh, these passages about how this, the sages use really odd appearance, another point that was also made in this morning, because the odd appearance of the sages have to do with, um, in some cases, have to do with being able to um, see or hear better. In other words, actually sensory overload because um, Shun is supposed to have double pupils, right? And the use ears is supposed to have three holes, three cavities. Um, and and the, the enumeration of these qualities, in other words, being uh, heightened sensory power, as it were, is also juxtaposed with some description of what we would normally identify as a kind of deformity. So, Zhou Gong is supposed to be hunchbacked, but that we are told is why he can uh, be so um, be such a good advisor to a young lord and bring about the realization of the way of Zhou and so on. So, in, in we have a case where um, the the um, with deformity and and heightened sensory power some, somehow belong together in in the discourse, and I find that to be interesting. So I want to um, end here and thank all three um, panelists for the really fine papers that from which I've learned a great deal. And I'm sorry about all the mishaps with my PowerPoint sharing and I will stop sharing. Uh, thank you. Professor Lee, would you like us to thank you for, for your um, discussion of the of the talks? Um, would you like us to take a few questions from the audience? I know I'm aware that we're past our session time. Um, I, I if the panelists agree that there must be questions for them as well. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah. Yes, if, yeah. if, uh, if you are um, all right with it, um, Professor Yates, um, Professor Chapman. Professor Bidner, is it okay? Okay, so we'll aim at we'll aim at um, at fairly concise um, replies because I see that we have exactly three questions. So whoever may can stay is very welcome to stay with us. Um, I believe that Professor Nylon wanted to um, to ask a question. Um, if you're still here please. with us, would you like to? Yes, please. 
Yes. Um, sorry, I'll start the, yeah, I'm here. Um, hi, um, it, this was a question for Mark Pittner. Um, uh, nice to see you, Mark, and everyone else. Um, my, my question is, is in your reading of Shunza um, and the ferocity of punishment, I think this goes all the way back to the documents, it's there in Mencius, it's a, a question about intentionality. But I also wanted to say that um, when we're trying to make sense of the, in other words, if you intend to do something wrong, no matter how small the wrong, it should be punished very fiercely. And, and everyone agrees on that. And I think it's not just um, a classicist position, uh, but it's pretty clear in legal texts as well. Um, but I also wanted to say when we're trying to um, take something that's rather small and then see um, how this fits to a larger societal picture, um, I have been struck time and time again about there is in Donghai, um, um, we have a record of who is released from corvée labor. And it's an astonishingly large picture, <laughs> uh, part of the population. And presumably it's only for one year, um, but a disability is mentioned there as is pregnancy, as in um, all kinds of other um, more temporary. And so um, I'll send you the reference, but I think um, I think that's my, my question swirl around trying to parse the smaller uh, passage to the larger societal context. And I, I guess I, I can just make some brief comments. Um, I, <laughs> I think I tried to indicate towards the in my conclusion that, that I have a similar op apprehension. What I'm trying to do is sort of create a a sort of spectrum and then fill that in. And that, and this is really about kind of setting, at least for myself and I hope for others, a kind of framework um, for those nuances. Um, and any references uh, people are willing to share, I, I am um, enthusiastic to accept them. Um, some of this, this paper really does come out of sort of my thinking about other projects and the kind of accumulation of ideas and trying to bring them together, I suppose. Um, and I think there's something to say, um, but yeah, I appreciate the feedback. It, part of this is, I think also um, the general comments uh, also by moderators that, you know, we have to be aware that single entries are just single entries and they need to be put into this larger context, which is the actual project. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. We don't have much time. I'll, I'll be in touch. <laughs> but I think this is about the larger scheme of how is the common good perceived um, at this time period. And it may not be the way we would perceive it. I'm, in fact, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> certainly we didn't want to, yeah, imply yeah, yeah, yeah. an anachronistic past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, no, you didn't. But you also didn't. don't want to miss the the actual, some of the subtleties here that I think are often dismissed, but anyways. Thanks. Thank you. So, Professor Lee, would you like to take it or should I um, read the question? Um, no, please do, I, I didn't actually see it. Um, yeah, so we, uh, have, um, we have a question um, to Professor Yates, I believe that is, uh, are the people who were disabled by punishments, did they have a different name, um, if you could find one? And, or will the books use different disabilities related terminology? So is there any sort of usage of the disability related terminology to refer to these people who have been mutilated by punishment? And what you've seen? Yes, okay, uh, very, very quickly. Um, the people who have had their legs chopped off or, or tattooed or whatever, um, as I indicated in one of my slides, but this is in the paper, they are not disabled. 
uh, and uh, they are not considered to be disabled. They're not pilong. Um, they are uh, all of those individuals who have been mutilated by the state. They are put to work, various forms of hard labor. So uh, the state is concerned with serviceable or non-serviceable, as I indicate, as I, I tried to indicate. So those who are mutilated, from the state's point of view, no, they are not. Uh, they are not disabled. So uh, that's a very interesting thing. It requires us then to, to think about uh, exactly what ability and disability is within the context of early China. And clearly the state has a different view perhaps from, uh, you know, if you like, normal speech, the speech that has been, uh, and the narratives and the philosophical texts and the historical texts that have been referred to uh, here. Um, in, can I reply just very briefly to Professor Nylon? Uh, in the uh, text that, uh, the document that you are mentioning uh, of uh, the scribe Rao's tomb, um, uh, Professor Olivia Milburn, and even in my paper, referred to another uh, text in uh, the document found in the tomb of a scribe at Songbo or so uh, Songbai, which also has a listing of the so-called pilong or disabled. And I think what one has to do is take into consideration that what is put in texts are not necessarily real or genuine documents. They may be based on them, but they're not, uh, if you like, authentic administrative texts. Uh, those are ones which were actually found in wells which have been abandoned by the state. So one has to take those, the, the rhetoric or the ritual context into consideration. And then finally, there was a question uh, from uh, Dr. Vivian Lowe to me regarding uh, the, the case that she refers to, which has been interpreted as leprosy. Um, unfortunately, uh, it does not appear as though leprosy is identifiable, uh, was identified in the state as pilong, uh, as being disabled. Um, it may have been a crime, but it was not, uh, they're not identified as disabled. So uh, again, this is a question that needs to be looked at further, but there are only these two very brief references in that uh, one text and nothing else has been discovered so far. Hopefully there will be, but uh, I can't say more than that at, the, at this point. So thank you very much. Um, if I may respond, the histories have references to people being excused from corvée labor. So Robin, I, um, and I take the point, which Li Yi also made, that each document has to be considered in its context, but I'm not necessarily, no, nor are other people necessarily throwing out this as having no connection to reality. No, I'm not. I'm not uh, throwing it out either, Michael. Don't worry. <laughs> I am. I am quoting it into my paper, in my full paper. Believe me. Thank you very much for your comment. So I think for today um, we'll bring this discussion to a close. And any lingering, and it seems like there are quite a few lingering questions from what we've discussed even at the very end of this discussion and from Professor Lee's very, very useful comments. Um, um, so, so some of these lingering questions, I very much hope uh, we will be able to discuss in the round table. And like you say, Professor Yates, it, it brings um, to mind again, the question of what is disability in the eyes of the, a given society, not in our eyes writing about disability in a given society. Um, which I think is for us to further explore um, together. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity that we have to, to all um, come together and discuss it. Um, I would like to thank all the participants of today's two sessions. Um, um, I would like to thank Professor Lee for, for moderating and taking the time to discuss the papers, to read the papers, comment on the papers, and 
um, um, bring up some, some, some of her own insights. Um, and of course, Professor Yates, Professor Chapman, and Professor Pittner for your, um, for your wonderful talks, and Professor Sturks, who had to leave um, for the wonderful keynote speech. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, for staying tuned in, and for the wonderful, wonderful talks. And have a lovely morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much, Avital. Thank you. Thank you.